Talk a little bit about why is it that we have a, a student movement and what is it, how is it that we can interpret why is it that you're here at the end, you know, sort of the, 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 the big picture of what we do that. And I think it has to do with several issues, right? The first one is your intellectual curiosity, because you're, you're a Spanish right now. At your age and, and immersed and you're all great students, you have this uh, intellectual curiosity, right? And you have some interest. We already know what we want to do as a mayor and stuff like that, or, or we're sort of clear about that. But the fact is that we learn in, in certain contexts, and I'm going to speak a, speak a little bit about that. We also know that there are campus issues that motivate us, so I, we want to take what might those uh, be, uh, you know, that, the experience that we have. Uh, we want to explore uh, how do we establish those links to the community in Puerto Rico, if we want to do solidarity with them. And we want to uh, see how it is that all this conversation about Puerto Rico and Puerto Ricans can be a sustained conversation, not just an event that we do. I mean, that's the whole purpose of cultural ambassador, that we practice, uh, uh, you know, cultural awareness, cultural activism, cultural engagement, right? And that we do that as, as we celebrate all, all the things that we do, whether we're LGBTQ or we're activists with the environment or we do that, it's a convergence of those interests. And I want to talk a little bit about that. And then the whole question of why social entrepreneurship. Now, some of you may be new to this language, right? But we find in our experiences, we're trying to say yesterday, but that's the theme that might unify the Puerto Ricans in Puerto Rico around a common cause that could be uh, transforming and historical, uh, uh, define us historically in the window that we are. And then some final thoughts on, you know, how can we be successful as we move along? So let me try to, uh, to speak to those, to those areas. So the first question that I have for you, this is not going to be in a test, right? But I selected a few of the great uh, philosophers of our time. And I, and I, uh, and I like you to, uh, you know, read, I'm not going to repeat everything, read those statements about what they think about education, okay? And I will advance to you that they have a common denominator. Uh, you take John Dewey. John Dewey is the father of exper experiential learning. And all the things that you do uh, when you're a practitioner in a factory, you have to be immersed. If you want to go to space, you have to be immersed. If you want to be a lawyer, you want to, do you want a surgeon that actually is theoretical? No. You want someone that knows how to you know, do their thing. But those, all that is experiential. Uh, you know, John Dewey is, uh, is an intellectual that brought that uh, type of uh, 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 learning to philosophy to uh, our uh, histo in historical terms. Nelson Mandela, everybody knows who he was, transform a country. But for him, at the end, education was liberation. Education was empowerment. Paulo Freire, everybody knows who, who that. Uh, uh, a prophet, really. Uh, he thought that liberation theology was all about about the poor understanding through education and, and the dialectic that, that generated knowledge for the poor with no formal education yet empowering the poor. Martin Luther King, okay, great philosopher as well. Uh, for him, education was the, the road to empowerment for the black community. And we have our own. Tony Pantojas, right, the great founder of Aspina and so many, uh, so many uh, causes, you know, community development and, and all that. She talks about the teacher as engaged with the student, right, that, that we t instructors, and you will become one of those shortly as, as you go into the world, we, we are really in a dialectic with the learner, right? That we're learners ourselves. And then finally, Luis Garden Acosta, who's the founder, just passed away recently, founder of El Puente, that talks about engagement as a way, as, as the only way you can do education, whether it's the environment. And El Puente, if you don't know what El Puente is, just go search it out. But what is it that they all have in common? This is not rhetorical. I want, I want to, to tell me. What's that? They, 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 see, they, they see education in a particular way, transformative to those that engage 
with their surroundings and the environment. If you want to be a doctor, maybe you want to, you know, practice medicine with the poor and see what is it that they feel. If you want to be a programmer, you may, you may want to apply your data scientist skills, your STEM person, you may want to apply that to the problems of the day. How do we do community planning? How do we do, how do we understand that an intervention that we have has any impact in society? And that, for me, that dialectic is the foundation of everything we do here. Because what we need to do is find out of your intellectual curiosity, where is the match? There are two matches that we need to do. One, your own interest as we move forward. But second, how do we converge in those interests to create something that is bigger than us, that we do collectively in action together, right? So having said that, um, I want to then turn to, uh, so any question on the empowering thing of education? Makes sense? Why? Because everything we're going to do here is about that connection between your intellectual, where you are in your moment right now in life. We know that because we can't invite you to come for a reason, right? We know that, that that's the one motivating factor that you all have in common, is that intellectual, uh, you know, formative experience that you're seeking now. And that's what we want to shape. Not to tell you what to do, but really to find those convergences that we said. Your own convergence with interest, because you understand, you're in social sciences, you're in the humanities. But there is a convergence at some point. And that's what we need to seek in this conference. It's a session conference for a, for a reason. But now I want to turn, if, if that's okay, to the context and Puerto Rico and the diaspora. And I said yesterday that we're in a unique historical moment. But it's really, I, I can't find any parallels except for the one I mentioned about the emergence of populism in Puerto Rico. And quite frankly, whether we're going to move to one way or the other is beyond me at this point. And you know, I figure I would like to be that smart, but I'm not. But I will have to say that all the data that I present here has been documented. We did a special issue of the Central Journal. Uh, everything that I said has gone through peer review. I'm just summarizing findings from a collective group of people. We did a conference with the Puerto Rican Studies Association. And so the, the, the findings that I, that I share with you here are pretty much uh, established uh, facts, right? Or established interpretation of reality. And it's important. The other thing that is important is that this publication, you should have gotten a, a copy of it. I'm not sure if you have one. Uh, but it's also, we've been doing webinars with classrooms across the country. Uh, we have done probably, probably a dozen or so. We, I don't know if you have heard us doing that, but we've done that in a, you know, quite often. And, less, and next semester, we also want to do campus visits. So if you want to bring this conversation to your campus, there are other authors like myself that can just coach people to the conversation. And we try to do it from a sort of a, to the extent that we can, uh, non-partisan perspective, I wouldn't say non-political because it's political, just a statement whether you're neutral or not is political, but non-partisan perspective, and we try to do it in uh, based on academic research. So, so what are some of the, of the highlights of the crisis in Puerto Rico? Well, it's really not one crisis. It, we're talking about crisis in Puerto Rico. That's the first thing we want to establish. It is obviously an economic crisis because of the debt, and reduce budgets and all that. I'll speak a little bit about that. But it's also, be, even before Hurricane Maria was a, was a humanitarian crisis, in Puerto Rico, over 45% of people are poor. If you look at children, over, you know, almost close to 60% grow in poverty. Now, that's not that different from Puerto Ricans in the US, by the way. So we have a great sector. So we have a bifurcated community. There are the middle classes like us, there are a few rich people and so forth, but a bunch of, you know, a significant portion of our communities are poor. And if you look, if you look at children growing up in single uh, female head of households, uh, we're talking about 70% and over poverty. Depends on the neighborhood. You know, the, the, so we have a humanitarian crisis in Puerto Rico, which also is reflected here in the diaspora. And, and we have a political crisis. Exhibit number one, PROMESA. But there's other problems in the political system. The, the, uh, a corrupt political system, for one, and I'm not going to expand too much on that. But there is really a lack of uh, leader, political leadership in Puerto Rico that transcends the situation, that, that cannot live up to the expectations of our people. 
Um, and this is sort of uh, a, a graphic that summarizes economic development in Puerto Rico over the last, uh, uh, you know, four decades. Uh, I don't know if I can turn a little bit here so I can I can point to the, to this. Oh yeah, no. Can you see the pointer? Yeah. Okay. So um, uh, in a nutshell, before 1980, this is the Economic Development Bank Economic Activity Index and it correlates to gross domestic product. So this is the economic activity in Puerto Rico for those of you who are not in social sciences, right? It's, but it's a very telling graphic. Uh, so before 1980, uh, you had, uh, in this period here, you have the first economic crisis. Uh, it was induced by the oil crisis and the whole collapse of the oil economy at that time. <laughs> And I don't want to get too much into the history of that, but, but Section 936 was enacted to get, overcome that crisis. And it did work, and it worked very well. Nine, Section 936 are the tax, the federal tax credits that induce investment in Puerto Rico. That investment went to manufacturing, high-tech manufacturing, and pharmaceuticals, okay? So how many of you knew this before? Eh, a few people, yeah. You should all be economists, but okay. So anyway, but in any case, uh, and then you know there are other details. I'm not going to get too much into that. But Puerto Rico didn't have the right to declare bankruptcy. That was part of the problem that we confronted up here, right? Up here. But anyway, so 936 works, and we go up and up and up and up and up in the economy, right? There were recessions along the way, but there were you know minor blips in the equation. But what happens here? Oh, Section 936 ends. It started to phase out in 1996. And this period here was the period when we thought that infrastructure development, el tren urban, el coliseo, el uh, centro de convenciones, was going to spark the, the, the economy back, it, back into action. Did it work? And they, they privatized hospitals and they did a lot of things to transform the economy. But at the end of the day, once 936 disappeared, this is what happens, right? And then Maria came, boom, right? So that's sort of the big picture of where we are. 936 was benefit and then was a curse. And 936 was congressional policy to Puerto Rico, keep it in mind. But that was not the only thing that was at play. The Puerto Rican leadership, were unable to create a different economic model for the island. Now I think we can move it. Now this is sort of a, I'm not going to spend too much time on the economics of this, but this is the distribution of employment in Puerto Rico. And what you can see there, I'm going to quickly tell you the highlights, is that, you know, start at the bottom and look at the federal government, right? And Sorry, at the government sector. The government sector declined. The government sector was one of the biggest sectors in the Puerto Rico economy. The other sector I want to look at you is, uh, that I want you to look at is construction. The collapse of construction, the collapse of the government, and if you look at manufacturing, how that correlates to the disappearance of uh, Section 936. Between 990, uh, 1995 and 2005, with, with the phase out of uh, 936, you see a decline for $153,000 in that sector, uh, uh, employed, uh, for 153,000 uh, uh, workers in that sector to 117. But look what happens if they can let after in 2017. That sector today is occupies 75,000 people. Now, why do you think this is important? This is related to the 936. The average salary, last time I looked, around 2016, for the pharmaceutical high-tech sector in Puerto Rico was $69,000 per person, including janitors and managers, okay? The average salary for the rest of the working class in Puerto Rico was 18,000. So it's not that we lost 70, you know, half of the jobs in that sector. It is that those were damn good jobs. All of those are revenues that you're pulling out of the government revenue, of the, therefore, the debt. Because the brilliant idea that they had, right, after the ending in 936, was to borrow money. So if they had invested in the Coliseo and all those other, the Tren Urbana, they have used that money and invested productively in a new alternative model, we wouldn't be in the problem that we are. But no, they borrowed 
and their investment busted. And that's the problem that we have faced. Yes, sir. Uh, can you just briefly describe the... the yeah, I would, I would go there. Yeah, yeah. I just need to give it the context. But I, yeah, no. uh, so this is the public debt in Puerto Rico. Each color represents a component of it. So the first color uh, is refers to the, govern, uh, the central government, the Commonwealth. And that's, you can see, that's the minor component. Then you have the municipal debt, which is minor too. And then the green one refers to the public corporations debt. This is PREPA, the electrical company, water, and all those other. We have about 80 public enterprises, big enterprises, right? And then the last one, the last bar, which is the, the last uh, uh, sort of at the bottom, the big one is COFINA, which is the, the tax, the tax uh, uh, that was imposed to pay for these bonds. But that's the composition of the debt. But what you can see is that between 1996 and 2006, the so-called strategy for a new economic model based on all the investments that I described increased the debt substantially during that period, right? And that debt even increased more after uh, 2006. Why? Because the, the divided government couldn't agree on what to do. So it was easier to do two things. Do not pay pensions contributions to workers in the government. That was brilliant, right? And the second one was to borrow more money to balance the budget. What did that do? It took us to a tremendous debt crisis and in 1970, uh, uh, and 2014, that come to a big halt. Okay, so I mean, I know this is too much economics for you. I understand that. Uh, my favorite subject, by the way. But I think it's important for you to have a little bit of grounding on what the origins of the, of the problem in Puerto, in Puerto Rico are and what we think might be some solutions for that. But this, this graphic is very telling. Um, so what are the brilliant ideas? So that was what they borrowed. But this, this other graphic is about Puerto Rico owns government workers $50 billion in pensions. These are people, people earn this money, but what did they do? They didn't make the contributions, and more recently, they eliminated that, and from here on, it's a pay-as-you-go system. Pay-as-you-go. Imagine your, your, your family that were working in the government now have to depend on whatever revenues are collected every day if you want to get your pension. And by the way, they're cutting their pensions too. But don't Right, yes. So, um, I noticed that when in, in I think it was two slides ago uh, where you had the conversation of the changes in the Puerto Rican economy in terms of manufacturing, mining, etc. Yes, that one. So I was sort of paying attention to how how it might be possible that the changes in, in, in the composition of the economy might be based on economic development and the social demographic transition model. So my idea was that this might be, a, it, it's a problem, but the, the extent of the problem might be more so based on whether or not we are still in need of mining because we're still building buildings and other infrastructure like bridges because we might still be in the industrializing phase of, of Puerto Rican development as far as the local economy goes. And then... That's a very tough question, which... I'll be glad to uh, engage with you on that because I've done some research in that area. But what I want to say, though, is that uh, that transformation of the economy, you know, especially construction, right? Think about what's going to be the recovery of construction. Puerto Rico has 18% of the housing stock. Every, of every five units that you see in any condominium or any, any urbanization or whatever, one of them is vacant. 18% of the housing stock of the housing units in Puerto Rico are unoccupied. And about less than 1% of those are in the bank's help, you know, bank or whatever, right? So when you think about what we can do to recover the economy, for example, what was the only sector that grew employment in 2016? Agriculture, created 8,000 jobs. What happened after Maria? What is the policy of the government towards the agricultural sector? It's a, you know, you, there's a young, strong movement of, of growers. 
that do farm to table, that do, you know, coffee, gourmet coffee, all kinds of things that we're reaching. And look at this. We have land. The Autoridad Tierra, we have land. There are idle tractors there. And we have people that would like to go to the, to the, to the, to the land. Where is the government program to do, just give the land to the people that want to grow? Where is that program? I haven't seen that program. So my point is that more than uh, a model that we like to develop is the model that will grow organically from what people want to do. And agriculture happens to be one sector that people want to do. They want to substitute what the food that we buy, right? How do we support that most? Big question. So you and I have a conversation, Femi, on the more deeper, uh, you know, it's like, uh, yeah, okay, I get it. Well, we'll get there. You and I, because, you know, believe me, I can't finish this if I go there. Uh, but, you know, so we have this mess. Something has to happen. And it did happen. Congress enacted PROMESA. PROMESA has two components. First one is, I'm going to allow you to restructure the debt. That's what you want. That's what the solidarity movement with the diaspora and all that wants. Yeah, we're going to let you do that. But here's a fiscal oversight board. We want to impose a control board. Why? Because you guys cannot take care of yourself. You guys do not know how to manage the economy. Okay? You guys, so I cannot give you the power to restructure the debt if you're going to be indebted a year later again. And if, if, now, were they right? <coughs> I don't know if they were right, but they have a point. They have a point, right? So they, we got both of them, right? So they established the oversight board. They gave that board unconceivable powers to override everything that the local government does, to oversee every grant, every, every transaction of more than $100,000. A lot of power. And they have used that power. And what they have used their power to we we'll get that in a second. But when they got there, look at that graphic. When they enacted this about June 30 of, of 2016, there were about equal opinion in the opinions, uh, you know, opinion polls in Puerto Rico. The, the Puerto Rican people were divided, about 50-50. But as we approached the elections, what happened? The support for the oversight board grew. My, my friends on the left couldn't understand that. But there was a poll done by a, a professor at Universidad de Sagrado Corazón that explains the whole thing. Why is it that the, the Puerto Rican people believed that the Junta was going to help Puerto Rico in opinion polls? Why? Because when, when they listed what institutions do you trust, what did they trust? The federal court, the FBI, the Supreme Court of the United States, all American institutions. What were the least trusted? The Puerto Rican government, the Puerto Rican courts, the police system. The people were just disillusioned with the way local institutions were supporting people. And that's what explained the support. But what happens thereafter, the story going short, is that then the junta started cutting the budget. Why? Because their only mandate was to balance the budget. And if you balance the budget, you have to only spend what you bring. And what you bring are lower revenues because the economy is in a collapse. So now the only thing you can do is cut services. Bring an idea. Cut services. And then, in the midst of all that, boom, a hurricane with devastating consequences for the economy, for the humanitarian crisis in Puerto Rico. Uh, you know, some people at the end think that that was uh, a benefit in disguise. I failed to see how the death of 3,000 people could have any positive impact, but I think in order to those victims, we can probably think about ways in which this might be uh, a lesson for us and, and a learning experience for us. Uh, but anyway, the hurricane was devastating. I'm not going to repeat the, name, the numbers about that, but all these maps you can replicate at Centro, by the way. You know, I'm going to talk a little bit about that. All of that is online. Uh, but, you know, the, the blue tarps, the floating, uh, the, the, you know, the structural damages to housing, all that was terrible. Uh, and, and even today, 
uh, besides uh, the tragedy of about 3,000 people dying as a result of the of the hurricane, uh, we have mental health issues, uh, you know, as, as, as indicated by suicide rates and so forth. We, to this day, we have intermittent energy. You're in a meeting and all of a sudden, boom, no lights. And, you know, what's going to happen from here on? They repair the, the grid, but it didn't bring it up to par. They just repair to bring electricity back. And I can go through all the sectors, uh, you know, what, where we are. But we estimated over $100 billion in damage. Uh, so one of the things that happened because of Maria uh, that started with the economic crisis is that, you know, as I mentioned yesterday, 2005, 2006, there were equal number of Puerto Ricans here and there. In, in the states in Puerto Rico. There have been a tremendous exodus of people since then. Our, our people have been redefined. We, the diaspora is now twice the size of the people that are remaining in the island. Think about that. Think about the fact that we're now dispersed throughout the United States with a concentration in Florida. But if you wanted to do political empowerment, you want to elect people, and you're all dispersed throughout the country, chances of electing people increase with the concentration. So we're going to increase electoral officials in Florida, but the rest of the dispersion. If you want to, if you want to introduce your children, and at some point you may have families, right, to the cultural heritage, where is the community? Where are the institutions? Go online to cultural ambassadors, but besides that, how are you going to preserve all that? Okay, so that that impact of the crisis and the hurricane on who we are in the States, not just who we are in Puerto Rico, has, been, has changed. We, this, we need to understand all of this. It's beyond our understanding right now. We haven't, we haven't experienced enough to write papers and, and do rallies and, and, you know, collective understanding of what this means to us, this separation. I can tell you at a personal level, when I left Puerto Rico four years ago, and presumably came out for two years, and here I am, you know, four years later, two kids later, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, my career pretty much going down. But, you know, lo que se fueron, they're all black, poor, que se vaya. We don't care about that. But today, when you go to Puerto Rico, I see the changing attitudes about the Puerto Rican diaspora. Why? Because you're all now in the diaspora, you're studying outside and all that, and now it's not so negro que se fueron los pobres, vamos a salir de ellos. No, ahora es, ese es mi nena, ese es mi hermano, ese es mi papá, porque los, los abuelos están yendo para Florida también, and then maybe some of their family stay in Puerto Rico. So now, this is very democratic. Now we all suffer. The, the, the diaspora, meaning the depart, you know, departing from your country of origin and doing this. So now the experience that was for the Eurekans and the people here now is a shared experience, including Puerto Rico. It's very rare to find people in Puerto Rico that have not lived in the United States. And that brings understanding. Just like uh, Maria brought an understanding of alternative energy, the app, the Pueblo de Apagón. You cannot talk about where we go with the energy system in Puerto Rico without talking about renewable energy and microgrids, in my opinion. That, that change in attitude is part of what defines this moment. We have an opportunity to then insert our own thinking as to that conversation of the diaspora, of the sector, agriculture, energy alternatives, and so forth. And this graphic tells a, a million uh, words, right? The, the, the so-called great, uh, great Migration back in the 50s versus the new migration. That's how it looks. What is the difference between the two? Magnitude-wise, it's already bigger now. Percent of population is a little bigger now. But what is the difference between the two? two? Todavía esto sigue. We're not at the end of the road. This is going to continue. Why? Because there are three reasons for migration from Puerto Rico to the United States, besides you guys talking which are a little minority of the whole group. Why? Number one is jobs. Second one is jobs. And third one is jobs. And the ones that don't leave because of jobs are going with their families because they got a job. And that's shown by, by data. 
So the only factor that leads to this separation of the people is the collapse of the Puerto Rican economy. If we rebuild the economy, we reverse the exodus. We reverse the separation of our communities. We, we bring some of you back and establish that bridge to the diaspora. We do a lot of things if we can rebuild the economy. Hey, we, we may even solve the status problem, but I'm not going to say that. I just say, but I don't want to say that. And, and this is how the population shows. And I, this is all I've said before. The blue line are Puerto Ricans in the U.S., the red lines are Puerto Ricans in, in Puerto Rico. The decline of population, which is exacerbated because now the population in Puerto Rico cannot even replace itself. The fertility rate, the, the women's having children rate is under two in Puerto Rico. It means that we, you know, there are no families to, pro, to grow our, uh, our people there. We have to find other ways to grow the population in Puerto Rico. But just having children, the people that are there, no. Why? Because the families that are having children are having them here in the United States. The young families. That's the reality. So we have bigger problems. Now, this is how we're going back to the, to the budget. I'm just briefly going to say this is the government budget. But what I want you to notice is what are the areas that receive the most draconian, significant, deeper cuts in the budget. Now, why is this related to what I was saying about the population loss? Because when we teach Economic 101, those of you who have taken that, the basic supply and demand model for a GDP and growth economy, the only factor that we put in that equation is population. In other words, aggregate demand depends on how many people you have, how many homes you buy, how many consumers buy food, how many, you cannot have a healthy economy if you're losing people, right? You look at all the devastated towns here that we, you know, uh, Ross Bell and all that. What is it that they need? They need immigrants. And it's been shown that those towns that receive immigrants, Latino immigrants, have a better economic recovery than the towns that are este, racista y no invitan a los latinos. Simple. And what's happening in Puerto Rico? Unless you grow the population, you're not going to solve the distribution of services. It's going to only go down with the revenues that you collect. Why? because you cannot borrow anymore. It's not because PROMESA doesn't allow you to borrow. It's because you don't have capacity to repay what you borrow. So the only thing you can do, right, is cut services. Education, police, right? That's where we are. That mess that you inherited, thank you very much to us, my generation, right? It wasn't my intention, but this is who we are, right? Your generation have a problem because you have to grow population in Puerto Rico. Que vengan los inmigrantes, que los dominicanos ya se fueron para para Santo Domingo. You know who's going to Santo to Santo from Puerto Rico to Santo Domingo? The Puerto Ricans are working in, in Santo Domingo now. Why? Because there are jobs there and, and they don't have jobs in Puerto Rico. How do we reverse all that? Okay. Now the other the other uh, the other important point there at the at the bottom there is some una partida que dice budget office. What your office? What, what is that? They're centralizing payments. Do you know what that is? That's the repayment of the debt. Look at those numbers. So of the budget of, what is it? Uh, how many billions there? Uh, 9.2 billion, 2.3 billion dollars, right? At the end of the day, 2.4, do your calculations, that's about one third. We'll go to repay the debt. Welcome to the new Puerto Rico reality. Welcome. Welcome. Yo tenía una pregunta aquí. Sí. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm great, right? You just send me those thoughts and there we go. Okay. So, and this is what the debt repayment looks like. Now, I this is more economics that you wanted to know, but I need to justify social entrepreneurship. I need I need to tell you why is it that we believe this is the strategy that we need to to focus on. Because if we solve the economy, we solve a ton of other problems, and we do it better for our people. This is the repayment of the debt that the government projected before the judge that decides restructuring settled on the COFINA bonds and now the PREPA bonds. Okay? This is what they projected. About 20% of the dollar. The blue line is what we would have paid, around $3 billion a year. And the red line is what the government projected they were going to repay the debt. This is both Garcia Padilla and Procedure administration. And the red line was about 20%. What was the COFINA uh, 
the COFINA restructuring over 50%. And some bondholders that are the privileged ones are going to get 90% of their investments, right? Which is interesting. And uh, PREPA is going to be also in the you know, 60, 70% of repayment. And by the way, with that repayment, not only you pay more money from the government budget, but you also increase five cents from 20 cents a kilowatt to 25 cents a kilowatt. And JI and others can correct me on this. And I guess that's 20% just next year on increases in electrical rates because of the debt restructuring. And by the way, it's going to be higher in years to follow. So you want to recover the economy, and okay? what the Industriales, the Manufacturing Association said, are you kidding me? Your solution to the economic crisis is increase the cost of electricity? Really? And the, and, and, and the legislature said yes. We need to pay the bondholders. And that's where we are. I'm trying to maybe to have you here. Oh, Tavi. Are you sure? See, but you're too radical for me. Okay, so at the end of everything, at the end of everything is said and done, everything is said and done, these are the projections from the oversight board. Now, for you, those of you who don't understand stacks too well, uh, the, 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 the blue line is what was projected before Maria, and the red line is what's projected after Maria. The red line, that bump that you see there, which was supposed to happen now, it hasn't happened yet, but Congress approved some funding for Puerto Rico, so you may see some of that bump. Now, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you, there are a couple of punchlines from this. The first one is that you can see that the economy is gonna bump, right? It's gonna be an increase in, in the economy uh, after the injection of post Hurricane Maria money. Uh, that's the red line. But what's, what is this graphic telling? that after, you know, let's say 2022, 2023, the economy is going to go back into a recession, meaning that the rate of growth of gross domestic product is going to be below zero. And this is the best they promise us, that after all the suffering, this is what we get? This is it? More depression in years to come? Por favor. You can even do better than that. Okay, there are ways to overcome this. But the point is that the projection from the junta itself, from the oversight board, is not a rosy picture. It is not. Okay? So, um, should we let them make all the decisions? A different question. So, there are some future. So, I don't want to be overly pessimistic. I'm going to tell you this is contested terrain. That will happen depending on what we do collectively as a people and what we do in the diaspora to support what's happening in Puerto Rico. How do we support agriculture? How do we support uh, new electrical you know, uh, systems, microgrids and alternatives? That's the point, that what they project is not reality. It's the reality that they project, but it's not reality. The reality is what we're going to do as a people. And I say in advance to you that there are a lot of people in Puerto Rico that wants to make a difference and want that prediction to be wrong that prediction to be challenged by us, okay? So, in terms of future scenarios, well, you know, we've seen that what, what the oversight board, balance budgets, and fiscal austerity are not enough. I think the austerity and the balance of budgets are inevitable. I don't see how we can overcome that because the government doesn't have the money and we can borrow it, so where is the money gonna come? So, cutting services is what it is. Do the schools have to be closed the way they have, abandoning the countryside? No. They, they could have been a different alternative. Do they have to penalize agriculture or manufacturing the way they do? No. Those things are not inevitable. Those things are policy. And we can influence policy. And you know, one policy that we need to influence is that Puerto Rico might be discriminated as citizens in terms of their benefits in Medicaid and other federal programs. But we're shortchanged in nutritional assistance and whatever because we're in Puerto Rico. And so do we have rights as American citizens to have those benefits like any other American citizen? So that's a question, it's a big question. I don't have a good answer for that. But if that's true, government can enact parity in our income tax, in child tax credit, in Medicaid. They can enact parity in some areas that will go a long way to solving this equation. Why? Because people have an over, 
uh, representation of the poor compared to any other jurisdiction. And, and so that we need to pay attention to that. Second, the, the, the sort of the, what's happening in Puerto Rico with the reconstruction is not a final, is not a final situation. We can change that. So our engagement in the economic reconstruction might be promoting a different scenario in the future. The third thing is that as you restructure Puerto Rico, right, and the, and the whole thing is how do you encourage that participation? I'm going to get there in a minute. Okay, there might be a realignment of political forces that are, you know, I, I don't want it, any one particular part, political party to win or lose elections. I want more transparency in the way government functions. I want more trans, uh, accountability in terms of the decisions that are made. Why? Because we don't want to go back to the 90s where we borrow, borrow with all the consequences that we have. And that, as you create this realignment of, of forces, you may have coalitions about good government, transparency, and accountability. Whether that's going to be blue or red or green or whatever, I don't know that. I don't want to get into that. But I think uh, you know, calling for accountability and transparency might go a long way. And the other big difference is that we're here in the diaspora with, you know, we have the majority of the population, the people of Puerto Rico. What is it that we're going to do here in the diaspora to support what's happening in Puerto Rico? And that solidarity movement that emerged a couple of years back, I think it's a defining, it's a game changer for the situation in Puerto Rico. That didn't exist before. This impetus of our diaspora wanting to look back at Puerto Rico and say, no, Congress, you have, you know, Mr. Trump, you cannot stop, you know, uh, financial aid for hurricane. You know, we, we are as beneficiaries the straw for act as any other jurisdiction. You have to send it. And Congress did. They just approved that, right? So we can influence that process. So in that context, why a national uh, student movement? And that's the topic of conversation here. Well, I, I already talked about intellectual development and, 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 and self. I'm going to say a couple more words about that. Uh, I think we need to think about how we do this in campuses and what is collective action for you. How do we move from here? We need to figure out links to the community, and we have brought some people that know that very well. Uh, we can help in that conversation, and then we need to figure out a right strategy to do that. So, uh, the first one is that your priority right now for me is that you need to learn. You need to, whatever you do, do it in a way that is formative to you. So if you want to be uh, an MBA, make sure that when you engage with uh, co-ops, uh, it's kind of hot here, right? Or is that just me? So, so you know that link with intellectual curiosity for me is 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 the foundation of everything we do. The other thing is that you need to to find the right fit for engagement. Okay, not everything fits you. But if you want to be a researcher, engage with research. If you want to be a, a business person, engage with entrepreneurship. If you want to do change in the environment. You can, you can do all kinds of things with, uh, with the environment, wherever you are. Whether you do it from your school here in the States, or whether you do partnership with Puerto Rico, that's what we need to figure out. And finally, uh, I think it's important with this changing reality that those of you who primarily come from Puerto Rico and, you're, and, and you are studying in the U.S., but you are kind of in a campus, you're kind of isolated, you need to understand our community in the diaspora better. You need to, if you want, to, to have roots in here, and you're probably going to change jobs. I mean, we have maps that show how people go. We're a nomadic population right now. And, and you know, you don't, don't ever give up your 787 number, because that's your connection to your networks. And when you start calling people, like if they were in the corner, you know, they're in Texas, and, and California, and Puerto Rico, and keep that 787. I have one that, you know, I haven't paid for a while, but anyway. So, but keep it because those are your networks, right? And, and, and I think uh, it's important if, if, you, if you share this experience that you came from Puerto Rico, you learn your history there, right? But you must understand how that plays out here, whether it's Florida or Massachusetts. And I, uh, yeah. Vamos a ver. Entonces, uh, I think. Um, uh, that we need to figure out campus issues, and there's going to be a session for that. I'm going to leave that to uh, to the people who are going to lead you in that direction. 
we need to figure out the links to the community, both here and in Puerto Rico. Um, uh, I think you may find that Centro has a number of initiatives that might be supportive of a student movement, that we need to find the convergence. And at the end of all the conversations, I will uh, comment back on what you, the feedback that you're giving to the organizers, and I will try to come up with how that is going to overlap. And, and, and this is just a listing of things that, that you will be exposed uh, throughout. Uh, one of the things that we introduced yesterday was the uh, idea Común, because that's a coalition that is civic sector that focuses on reconstructing the economy and focuses uh, on social entrepreneurship as the method, which is to empower local leaders to understand how federal funding works and what they can do to use that for the social uh, sector, meaning uh, uh, you know, affordable housing, uh, creating uh, mixed commercial developments that use federal funding, mitigation programs you know, for the environment, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, so why social entrepreneurship? A, this is not something that Alberto and I came out with. Okay? This is, came out of our search conferences in Puerto Rico. What people want right, is to know how they can use federal funding to affect social purpose in Puerto Rico what is the reconstruction of the housing stock, the reconstruction of the community infrastructure to use other, yes? So the main source of capital would be different funds? Well, yes and no. Because one of the biggest uh, determinants of this moment in Puerto Rico is the co-op movement. Co-ops grew from 800,000 to more than a million uh, post Maria. And the difference with this co-op movement is that now they uh, they are engaged in production. It's not just lending you money for consumption, but now they're investing in energy co-ops, water purification system. Uh, you know, uh, they're, they're thinking about what, they've always been involved with affordable housing, but they're thinking now how do we use affordable housing for neighborhood revitalization, Los Casco, you know, the, the, the inner cities in Salina and all these places that are destroyed, how do we use this funding to rehabilitate, uh, you know, that? Has social, has social entrepreneurship works somewhere else? I do not well, no, no, the industry, I mean, I, I didn't go into that in, in much details, but the industry here in the States is a very robust. It's several billion dollars, you have more than 4,000 community development corporations, uh, you have big intermediaries like LICS, Local Initiative Support Corporation, uh, you have private inter intermediaries, you have enterprise, you have neighborhood works, there's a whole system that promotes exactly this in the United States. And part of what we're trying to do is link the system here to, to people in Puerto Rico. Because though they have, I mean, we have people that are very good in Puerto Rico, we just don't have enough. See. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so I'm going to provide one example of how to work in Puerto Rico, uh, how to work in the States. Uh, so for those who don't know, cooperative is essentially a kind of business, but you know, the, the, best, the customers are the owners, and, and everyone gets one vote and some by your share. And electric co-ops, like through electric services, over 900 of them exist here in the United States. And they service over 40% of, of, of the U.S. technicians. Uh, in Puerto Rico right now, all public and a little bit more now because it's going to be all public. Um, the energy clock model is super successful here in the States. They can actually be okay. used as a, as, as a federal alternative like for 80 days for the private sector. The other, the other example, besides the energy sector, will be agriculture. Yeah. A large proportion of agriculture in this country is by co-ops. In Puerto Rico, they, they have like Indulac is a co-op and so forth, but there, there's proportionally less than other sectors. So in any case, uh, it's... Can it's you say that social No, no, the, the numbers of people and organizations do it. So that's what we need to build capacity for people that knows how to do it and for organizations to do it. Because the only way to learn to do this is by doing it. Okay? You cannot become an effective surgeon unless you practice. And you need to practice with someone who knows what they're doing first. And then you go into that. That's what we're trying to do. Create a positive process whereby we train people on how to do this. 
We have resources from the diaspora. We have resources in Puerto Rico. We need to mix them. Why? Because the, the diaspora has a lot of experience in social entrepreneurship, lots of experience. And we have people that come to our conferences that want to help. But I cannot go to Puerto Rico and tell people what to do. A, they're not going to do it. I mean, por favor, you know, that's not going to work. But B, it's impractical because you need to create capacity locally to be able to sustain this. Okay, I need to rush through the next few slides. So this is our view of capacity building with, uh, with IDEA Common. Okay? Uh, there is an individual level, and what we need to do that is train professionals. There is the organizational level, and what we do to that, to need to do there is promote projects that will teach organizations how to do it. There are some organizations that do it in Puerto Rico, and right now as we speak, we're doing some case studies of how they do it so that we can use that for pedagogy, for practical purposes. I have a couple of people here that are going to do case studies in Puerto Rico, right? Hey! Yeah! So anyway, so you can talk to them or to us if you want to do that. As you do a case study, you learn, right? And then the professors and instructors, professionals in the field can use it to teach other people. Yeah. Uh, okay, so, uh, so we have the individual level, we have the organizational level, we have the sectors, energy, agriculture, and so forth. And we have the across sectors conferences that Centro co-sponsors, IDEA Comuns co-sponsors. So you can all participate in that stuff. We just need to figure out what is it that, that you can do and you want to do. Um, so one of the things uh, we're going to introduce in one of the seminars uh, is the GIS, the use of the GIS. We have a platform. Now, for those of you who think that you know, GIS would be beyond me, well, these layers will allow you to do all kinds of socioeconomic analysis. And it will allow you to do, do all that in maps or, or download tables. So if you want to help an organization and you learn these skills, you can help them then proposals to do this social entrepreneurship stuff. From here, you don't have to be there. See. Uh, but anyway, I'm not going to go into, we're going to, we use as a foundation for our analysis the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, and we're adding the goals of the Action Plan in Puerto Rico for the re economic recovery. All of those are layers that you can map, right? And then you have goals, and then all you need is a theory of change that will explain the inputs. What causes those indicators to change? And we have seminars, and we can train you in doing that. What you need to think is, is, is this what I want to learn? Is this something that's going to benefit me in my career as a business person, as a scientist? If you answer yes, we got something for you. This is the kind of thing you can do with community planning with the layers of maps that we have. You know, you can map, you have, you know, that's a photo. You can take the photo out. You have the floating areas there. You have the, the, the vacant homes. You have the, the vacancy rates in the area. You can do a lot of things. And we have webinars that train you in doing all this from whatever you are. If you want to help a community, you don't have to be there to do this. Socioeconomic analysis, community planning. Community planning is very important right now in Puerto Rico. This is the skills that, it's, this is in Spanish, these are the skills that we're trying to infuse in Puerto Rico. Now, you may not be an instructor now because you need to have certain expertise to do social entrepreneurship, but you definitely can be an assistant to a lab session or to a professor in Puerto Rico and help students answer questions. We train you and you can be a lab assistant. And believe me, if you think you're behind, the community people in Puerto Rico need a lot of help in this area. How to manipulate data, how to build the case to get grants, how to present a narrative that explains their case, that explains what their aspirations are, and so forth. So we can, we can work with you on that. So we have some other events. You can see I'm going to speak faster now, because I have someone bugging me there. Um, so, um, sorry. Uh, so, you know, we have some events central that might be of your interest and things that you can think about being part of or bring it to your campus. Uh, so we have a couple of summits with uh, New York and, and DC and trying to figure something in Florida and New England. Uh, we have uh, the, 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 the special issue of the journal that I mentioned, all this lecture is part of that conversation. You can bring it to your campus. You can bring it to a classroom as a webinar or you can bring it to a campus. If you're gonna have 50, 100 people, we pay someone to go there and do it with you. If I can, I will go. Um, so wrapping up. Um, so and then we, we we throw out there with the organizers, the planners, uh, uh, that uh, we may have something in Puerto Rico next summer. You guys need to figure out whether that's a good thing to do. 
And if we're going to do it, who's going to do it? That's the whole thing. If we don't have people that buy this idea and want to do it in Puerto Rico, we're going to Because remember, it's all about building bridges, but bridges are relationships. We can't do a physical bridge. We have to do it between, in relation between people. Your network, the network that you're creating, is going to serve you well moving forward in, in, your, uh, in your career. Um, so uh, those are some of the conferences that we sponsor. We're going to have more. As I said, a couple they are coming around September 20, the anniversary of Hurricane Maria. We want to make a statement with these events. What is the statement? We're here. We're here to stay. You're going to have to deal with us in the diaspora, right? We're going to support Puerto Rico and all that. Uh, so, so final thoughts. Sometimes people think that adding a lot of things to the agenda make it a stronger agenda. I will advance to you that the more you focus on one point of convergence and agreement, the stronger the coalition is. If we don't have agreement about the environment, or abortion, or you know, birth rights, or whatever it is, uh, you know, find points of convergence. That's the, my first thing, right? I would say one of those divisive issues is the status of Puerto Rico. My approach with that is very simple. You know, I take uh, uh, the the, the, the preacher as an example. They preach in Sunday. So if you want to do resistance and opposition and whatever, for statehood, for independence, that's your right, you should do it. But the rest of the week, if you want to have credibility with your people, you better do like the preach, preachers do. Do the mission, you know, serve the needy, uh, console the, the people suffering, do something, whatever it is, the rest of the week. Be selective as if you want to do that. So as my point is, you know, you've got to be strategic in terms of how we unite with each other. And if we don't agree on certain things, just put it aside. Focus on what we can do together. And that's the goal that, we, that we're trying to do here. So, in any case, I feel that what we're doing here is a, will be, should be, could be a long-lasting legacy that we leave uh, to this generation and generations to come. So, in any case, and we do that because we're one people and we need to do it Para los de aquí, de la diáspora, meaning, and para los de allá, los que se quedan en la isla and need our help and support. So, I don't know if I have time to take a couple of questions, but. Uh, no. No, okay. So, see me, uh, if you have written questions, you see me on the side and I'll try to answer. So, gracias.